Hi again and welcome to Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Foundations course. Although Python is an excellent programming language that can be used for a lot of things, you must know that code execution in Python is not as fast as other programming languages like C or C++, for example. So it means when working with huge amount of data for your machine learning projects, wherein you need to harness your computer's hardware capacity or computing power, like processing multiple tasks in parallel and efficiently utilizing memory resources, then the built-in Python sequences like list and tuples will not be enough. So in this lesson, we'll talk about NumPy arrays. NumPy is a fundamental package for scientific computing in Python. It is a Python library that provides a multidimensional array object along with a large collection of high-level mathematical functions, logical operations, discrete Fourier transform, lineal algebra, statistics, and much more. While NumPy is written partially in Python, but most of the parts that require fast computations are written in C or C++. In effect, data objects in a NumPy array can be processed 50 times faster or more than an ordinary Python list. So to start using NumPy, you must first install it and it is very easy. However, if you follow the same installation procedure that I have shown you in lesson 2 of this course using Anaconda distribution, then you are good to go. To use it, type the import keyword. And in Python, programmers normally use the as keyword as an alias to give an alternate name like np for simplicity. So you can now use the np instead of numpy in your code. To create a NumPy array, you can do it in several ways. First is to simply call the NumPy array function and pass in a Python list. Note that the type of array object in Python is ndArray. Now, to understand array better, there are several important differences between NumPy arrays and the standard Python sequences. First, NumPy arrays have a fixed size at creation, unlike Python list, which can grow dynamically. Changing the size of a NumPy array will create a new array and delete the original one. The elements in a NumPy array need to be of the same data type, unlike Python list, which could be of any type. In effect, this will occupy the same size in memory. Though there is an exception wherein you can have arrays of Python objects thereby allowing for an array to be of different size elements. The elements in a NumPy array are stored in contiguous memory locations, meaning consecutive memory blocks. This makes array manipulation more efficient compared to a Python list, wherein memory allocation is non-contiguous. To give you a simple illustration on how fast a NumPy array as compared to a Python list, consider this example. I'll import the time module, but note that it is best to place all your import statements at the topmost part of your code. I'll just put it here for demonstration purposes only. And then I'll create a Python list that holds a range of numbers. Let's make this 10 million. And then I'll set the start time. And now, I'll perform a simple scalar addition to each element using a for loop, and then store each element in a new Python list. Then, I'll set the end time. And finally, let's see the total elapsed time for Python to execute this scalar addition for 10 million elements. And now, Let's use the same approach, but this time we'll use a NumPy array. And instead of using the Python's built-in range to generate 10 million sequences of numbers, I'll use a similar but more suitable function in NumPy, the arrange function. This returns a NumPy array. Note that you can also pass here an optional start and step arguments, same as when working with the Python's built-in range sequence. Now, one major advantage of NumPy Array is that you can use vectorization in your code. This removes the use of explicit looping and indexing to perform mathematical calculations to your data. This makes your code concise and easy to read, 
but behind the scenes, there is an optimized precompiled C codes taking place that operates on your ND array object element by element. NumPy is capable of detecting SIMD instructions. SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data. This means that your multiprocessing system can perform the same operation on multiple data points simultaneously in parallel. So basically, this vectorized code performs at near C speeds, but with a code simplicity of Python. And as you can see, it executes much faster. For this simple example, adding a scalar value of 10 million elements, NumPy array executes about 40 times faster than a Python list. You can try and test for different operations like matrix multiplication, element deletion, and so on, and discover for yourself how fast NumPy array is. There are several ways on how to create a NumPy array. Aside from the array function and the A range function that we have illustrated, you can also call the empty function to create an empty array by passing in the shape and two optional arguments of D type and order. Say I want a one dimensional NumPy array with five elements of type in 32. Now, notice that when you do this, your array is not yet clean. It could contain garbage data used by the memory from its previous operations. And if you want to create a NumPy array with zeros already placed for each element, then you can use the zeros function. So, as a result, we have a one-dimension NumPy array with five zero elements. If you want to create a two-dimension NumPy array, then pass in a tuple like three, five, and it creates a NumPy array with three rows and five columns. You might also want to initialize your NumPy array that consists of ones instead of zeros. So instead of using the zeros function, use the ones function. This creates a two-dimension array with five rows and four columns. You can also create a NumPy array of zeros or ones with a shape similar to an existing array. Suppose you have a NumPy array from a list of two rows and three columns. Then, to create another array with a shape similar to this one, with all its elements as zeros, you use the zeros-like function. Similarly, you can use the ones-like function. You can also use the linspace function to create a NumPy array that has a value evenly spaced from the given interval. Say I want an array that has 15 evenly spaced numbers from 1 to 10. And normally, when working with NumPy, you would want another plotting library that you can use to visualize your data. In this example, we'll introduce the use of matplotlib. Most of the matplotlib utilities lies under the pyplot submodule and are usually imported with an alias of plt. Also, you need to include this code, matplotlib inline, to set the back end of the matplotlib to inline, which means the output plot will be displayed in line with Jupyter Notebook directly below the code cell where you had entered the command. So to plot your data, simply use the plot function and pass in the NumPy array with each data point plotted as X mark. Here, you can see 15 data points evenly spaced from numbers 1 to 10. You can also use the NumPy's random.randint function to generate random array of numbers from any given range and shape. So for example, I want 5 random numbers from 1 to 99 and return it as one dimension array. I'll duplicate this code and I can use a tuple to specify the output shape as a 3 by 5 two dimensional array of random integers from 1 to 99. You can also use the function reshape 
to change the current shape of your NumPy array without changing its data. Say, instead of a 3 by 5 array, I can reshape it to an array of 5 rows by 3 columns and then store it to a new variable A. Or I can reshape this to just a single dimension array with 15 elements and store it to variable B. Note that the original array is not affected by this operation. Aside from functions, there are also some important NumPy array attributes that you should know. The nDim refers to the number of axes or dimensions of the array. The shape refers to the dimensions of the array. This is a tuple of integers indicating the size of the array in each dimension. The size refers to the total number of elements of the array. This is simply equal to the product of the elements of the shape. In this example, a 3 by 5 matrix has a total size of 15. The dtype attribute refers to an object describing the type of the elements in the array. It could be a standard Python types or NumPy types like int32 or float64. The item size attribute refers to the size in bytes of each element of the array. So for example, since this array is of dtype int32, it means that each element occupies 4 bytes of memory. There are situations where you need to create an array from an external file like a text file, and there are a couple of ways to do it. First, you can use the Python's open function to open a file. This requires two arguments, the file name and the mode. I already have a sample text file here in the same directory with my notebook file. This is id.txt file, consists of pure numbers with values ranging from 0 to 255. And to open it in our Python code, I'll pass in a string of id the text, and if I don't supply the mode, the default is read. Then, I'll call the function to read all the lines from this text file and then store it in our variable txt data. Now, let's check the content of this variable. And let's see how many lines we have read from this text file. Okay, so we have 805 lines stored in this variable and with each line having several numbers in it. Note that this variable is created as a Python list. But if you want to create a NumPy array from a text file, you use the load text function. This creates a two-dimensional array of floating point numbers. This is indicated by the dot in every number in your array. However, you can explicitly tell this function to load this text file using the NumPy's int32 data type. Note that the ones that you see here is just a portion of the entire array. If the array is too large to fit, Jupyter only shows the first few data and the last few data items. Let's check its shape. So it is a matrix with 805 rows and 806 columns. Its size is 648,830 items in this array. Now I'll use the matplotlib's pyplot submodule and call its function imshow to visualize this 2D array. And as you can see, this 2D array is just a numerical representation of my monochrome ID picture. It only has one color. 8-bit with varying shades from dark to light represented by numbers 0 to 255. I can add another attribute to this imshow function and render this image in grayscale. Now, since this image has lots of pixels in it, 805 by 806, I can display this image a bit bigger using the pyplots figure function. and set its size to 10 by 10 inches. However, the equivalent output pixel depends on the screen's resolution you're using. Another way to create an array from an external file is through the NumPy's load function. 
when using the load function, you can pass in any standard binary file format, that NTY. This is a NumPy array stored in a disk. Again, I have a file id.nty that resides on the same directory as this notebook file. So, this NumPy array has three dimensions, 805 by 806 by 3. And of course, its size is way bigger as compared to the previous data that we have. It is now 805 times 806 times 3, almost 2 million data points. So, let's have a glimpse of this data. And I'll call the pyplots imshow function again to render this data. And as you can see, this is the same image as before, but the main difference is that it has a third dimension to represent the 24-bit RGB colors. 8-bit for each red, green, and blue colors, with values ranging from 0 to 255. This is the one that you see when you check the details of your image as the bit depth. So think of it as, if you have an image with a dimension of 805 by 806 pixels, height and width, then you have a total of 648,830 pixels, and each pixel contains the three values of RGB colors. So same with the Python list, you can apply indexing and slicing to a NumPy array. Consider this example. Say I'll slice this image and get only portion of it and store it to a new NumPy array, guess who? And I'll slice the row from index 200 up to row index 399. And then I'll get a slice of its column from index 200 up to column index 414. This is about half of my face vertically. Then, I'll get all the three RGB colors from index 0 to index 2. And we were able to get only portion of my face and reference it using this new variable. Say, I'll get only my eyes, and that's probably from row index 250 up to row index 249. Now, if I want to include all the columns in this slice, just put a column to it without any value. Same with the third dimension. I'll include all the colors. We can also simplify this code further. I'll copy this, and instead of using colon for each dimension, I can replace this with just three ellipses, which means include the remaining dimensions or full slice. We can also specify the step using the double column notation. In this case, I'll reference it to another variable. This new array variable is smaller because it only gets every third pixel of the original image. And this is one way of reducing your image resolution. In this case, it is reduced to only 269 by 269 pixels. In here, you hardly notice the difference from the original image. No pixelation so far, and the image quality still looks good. I'll step every sixth pixel of the image, so you can see that the new image is now pixelated. Now, it has only 135 by 135 pixels. You can also apply negative slicing. In here, I'll read the columns starting from negative 1, right to left, and this renders our image to flip horizontally. Now, let's read the rows in reverse from bottom to top. And this renders our image to flip vertically. You can also flip vertically and horizontally at the same time. So if you have an RGB image and you don't want to use the 24-bit color and only use 8-bit to render a monochrome image, simply set the third dimension to 0. Let me check the sample data. 
And this is no longer a three-dimensional array. It has only two dimensions. Now, each pixel in this array is an 8-bit with values from 0 to 255, darker to lighter shade. I can also threshold this image by first figuring out all the pixels that are darker than a certain value, say below 128, and then setting it to 0. This results to some sort of a two-dimensional Boolean array. I'll display the image in grayscale, and this is the resulting image. You can also use slices to simultaneously set or change the values of the NumPy array. Say, I'll put a green square at the upper right corner of my original array. So from row 0 to row 99, and from column 706 to column 805, you can see that every pixel is set to RGB of 255 for each color. This means white. So I'll assign a new value for the RGB of these selected pixels. Red is 0, green is 255, and blue is 0. I'll display the image, and as you can see, the green square appears at the top corner of this image. Now let's try another one. I'll place an orange line at the bottom of this image that is 50 pixels thick. So I'll start from row index 755 up to row index 804, and then just a column to have a full slice of the column. And then the RGB of orange is 255, 165, and 0. And there you have it. There is also another very important distinction when working with NumPy array as compared to a Python list. For example, if we have a list of five elements, and from this, I'll get a slice of the first three elements and then assign it to a new list, changing the values in the new list doesn't affect the original list. However, this is not the case with the NumPy array. Say I'll create a new NumPy array, and call it a square, and then get this green square of 100 by 100 pixels and assign it to this new array. Now, if I change the value of this square array, say I'll slice an inner square and set it to blue, in effect, this change does not only affect the new square array, but also the original array. Note that when you do this, NumPy doesn't create a new array in memory, but instead, it only creates a new variable that points to the same memory location of the original data. So if you want to create a true copy of a NumPy array, use the copy function. Changing the values of your new array does not affect the original one. When you're done manipulating your array, you can save it to a file. Using the NumPy save function creates and saves your array to a cross-platform binary file format. Here is the newly created NumPy array file, and just to check if we have saved it correctly, Let's load it one more time to a new variable and check its content. And there you go. So now, if you want to practice with NumPy to manipulate your own 2D and 3D array of images, you can use several libraries to load images in your program, one of which is PIL. It stands for Python Imaging Library. To use it, simply import pil.image then use the open function and pass in any valid image file. I have here bird.jpg. And finally, you can create a NumPy array and call the same array function and pass in this image variable. Let's display it. And it works perfectly. 
NumPy is extremely useful and fast in numerical calculations. There are dozens of math and statistical functions that you can benefit from, and it is impossible for us to discuss everything in here in just a few minutes. Just to give you some examples, say if I have a variable x consisting of 64 elements of equally spaced numbers from 0 up to 5 times pi, then to get the sign of every element of this array, I'll call the sin function and then pass in x. And this is the sine value of x. So now we can plot this and see how it looks. I can also do multiple plot statements, say a cosine of x, and then a logarithm function. And both functions are shown together. Also, to show you some statistical functions, consider this sample array. Say we have 25 random scores from 0 to 100. I'll plot this. And if we want to get the mean or average of the scores, simply call the mean function. Or if we want the median or the positional average of the scores, use the median function. We can also check out how spread out the scores are using the standard deviation function, STD. We can also get the lowest score and then the highest score using the mean and the max function. Note that you can also get the index of the lowest and the highest scores using the argmin and the argmax functions. Well, there's a lot more to cover, but here are some of the basics that will get you started when working with numerical data. If you're interested to know more about the NumPy library, you can visit the numpy.org for detailed documentation. Up next, we'll discuss another flexible and easy to use open source data analysis and manipulation tool, the Python Data Analysis Library, or PANDAS, often referred to as Panel Data. And again, thanks for watching. And if you learned something of value here, please click the like and subscribe button for more programming tutorials. This is Joe Edgo and hope to see you again in the next lesson.